Callie here, and welcome to Urantian Artist Podcast. Today's episode, episode 40, titled Jesus, the Light of the World. Thank you for joining me, everyone, and thank you for being here. Throughout the ages, women have had many obstacles and stumbling blocks simply because we are not men. Women have been punished, imprisoned, and held captive for our aspiration of knowledge and have been met time after time with a fruitless field in our pursuit of the acquisition of the equivalent rights as men. Women who had interest in learning about medicine in the days of the past, have been called witches and daughters of the devil. Women have gone through many trials and have experienced inconceivable hardship and misfortune. And still, even today, we can see this in the way that women are often overlooked and excluded for high-paying jobs and are not allowed to be a part of sacred ceremonies which men are always allowed to participate in. Women are taught we are meant only to serve a man and how we are nothing more than child bearers and child rearers. This sad plight of women throughout the ages has affected women all over the world. Primitive man thought only great warriors or the tribe's medicine man and priests had souls. Women were regarded even less than an animal who definitely had a soul as well as a spirit to direct that soul. Of course, the suppression of women begins with the story of Adam and Eve, for it is then that we are told of how Eve was somehow made out of Adam's rib and how Eve was directed by God himself that she was created to exist only as an aid to Adam. This twisted story that has been modified and changed to befit man as the highest type of mortal being on earth puts woman in her place of never being first. But what is the truth of Eve's position and mission on earth? In paper 45 and 74 of the Revelation, we read, In 45.5.3, we read, Material sons and daughters are the highest type of sex-reproducing beings to be found on the training spheres of the evolving universes. In 74.1.2 we read, At the time Adam was chosen to come to Urantia, he was employed with Eve in the trial and testing physical laboratories of Jerusalem. For more than 15,000 years, they had been directors of the Division of Experimental Energy as applied to the modification of living forms. Long before this, they had been teachers in the citizenship schools for new arrivals on Jerusalem. In 74.1.4, we read, They were put under joint oaths of allegiance to the Most High of Edentia and to Michael of Salvington. In 74.0.1, we read, At the time of their arrival, ten days passed before they were recreated in dual human form for presentation as the world's new rulers. They regained consciousness simultaneously. In 74.3.5, we read, On the fourth day, Adam and Eve addressed the garden assembly. This was a great day, and it closed with a feast for the council of men and women who had been selected to assume responsibilities in the new administration of world affairs. Take note, women as well as men were in this group, and it was the first time such a thing had occurred on earth since the days of Dalmatia. It was an astounding innovation to behold Eve, a woman, sharing the honors and responsibilities of world affairs with a man, and thus ended the fourth day on earth. In 74.7.22, we read, Adam endeavored to teach the races sex equality. And lastly, in 75.8.2, we read, There has been no fall of man, 
The history of the human race is one of progressive evolution. And so now we learn the real truth that Adam and Eve were both equally taught and employed as scientists, teachers, directors, and then together took an oath to the Most Highs of Edentia and Michael of Salvington and became our world's rulers. Adam and Eve were brought to earth together and were recreated at the same time. Eve was and is a strong, courageous, intelligent, loving woman who helped civilization by upstepping our genetics. The story of Adam and Eve is not a story of how woman is subservient to man. Adam and Eve's life mission here on earth is about love, loyalty, and struggle to create a better society. And although they met with many hardships, in the end, they accomplished their goal and they did help the world and improve our races. In paper 150 of the Revelation, Jesus then freed women for all time and set forth the most amazing proclamation of truth, which is that women are absolutely spiritually equal to men. In paper 150.1.1, we read, Of all the daring things which Jesus did in connection with his earth career, the most amazing was his sudden announcement on the evening of January 16. And I quote, On the morrow, we will set apart ten women for the ministering work of the kingdom. End quote. These ten women selected and commissioned by Jesus were Susanna, the daughter of the former Chazan of the Nazareth Synagogue. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the steward of Herod Antipas. Elizabeth, the daughter of a wealthy Jew of Tiberias and Sepphoris. Martha, the elder sister of Andrew and Peter. Rachel, the sister-in-law of Jude, the master's brother in the flesh. Nasanta, the daughter of Elman, the Syrian physician. Milka, a cousin of the Apostle Thomas. Ruth, the eldest daughter of Matthew Levi. Celta, the daughter of a Roman centurion. And Agaman, a widow of Damascus. Subsequently, Jesus added two other women to this group, Mary Magdalene and Rebecca, the daughter of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus authorized these women to affect their own organization. It was most astounding in that day when women were not even allowed on the main floor of the synagogue, being confined to the women's gallery. To behold them being recognized as authorized teachers of the new gospel of the kingdom. The charge which Jesus gave these ten women as he set them apart for gospel teaching and ministry was the Emancipation Proclamation, which set free all women and for all time. No more was man to look upon woman as his spiritual inferior. This was a decided shock to even the twelve apostles, Notwithstanding, they had many times heard the Master say that in the kingdom of heaven there is neither rich nor poor, free nor bond, male nor female, all are equally the sons and daughters of God. They were literally stunned when he proposed formally to commission these ten women as religious teachers and even to permit their traveling about with them. The whole country was stirred up by this proceeding, the enemies of Jesus making great capital out of this move, but everywhere the women believers in the good news stood staunchly behind their chosen sisters and voiced no uncertain approval of this tardy acknowledgement of women's place in religious work. And this liberation of women giving them due recognition was practiced by the apostles immediately 
after the master's departure, albeit they fell back to the olden customs in subsequent generations. Primitive man thought only priests or designated holy men could communicate with God, that is, get and receive messages from God, see God in dreams, or see God in real life. Women could not have such extraordinary experiences. Only men could ever be a mouthpiece to and from God. We see this in religion today. Only the prophet, who is a man, can receive inspiration, messages, or revelation. A woman cannot receive any or all of these. But what is the real truth? Who can receive messages from God? Who does God give messages and revelation to? In paper 189, we read about the resurrection of Jesus and whom Jesus appeared to first. In paper 189.4.3, we read, A little before three o'clock this Sunday morning, when the first signs of day began to appear in the east, five of the women started out for the tomb of Jesus. The women who went on this mission of anointing Jesus' body were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the Alpheus twins, Salome, the mother of the Zebedee brothers, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and Susanna, the daughter of Ezra of Alexandria. It was about half past three o'clock when the five women laden with their ointments arrived before the empty tomb. They were greatly surprised to see the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, inasmuch as they said amongst themselves on the way out, who will help us roll away the stone? By this hour, there was just enough of the dawn of a new day to enable Mary to look back to the place where the master's body had lain and to discern that it was gone. In the recess of the stone where they had laid Jesus, Mary saw only the folded napkin where his head had rested and the bandages wherewith he had been wrapped lying intact as they had rested on the stone before the celestial hosts removed the body. The covering sheet lay at the foot of the burial niche. After Mary had tarried in the doorway of the tomb for a few moments, she did not see distinctly when she first entered the tomb. She saw that Jesus' body was gone, and in its place only these grave cloths, and she uttered a cry of alarm and anguish. All five of the women then sat down on the stone near the entrance and talked over the situation. As these women sat there in the early hours of the dawn of this new day, they looked to one side and observed a silent and motionless stranger. For a moment, they were again frightened, but Mary Magdalene rushing toward him and addressing him as if she thought he might be the caretaker of the garden, said, Where have you taken the master? Where have they laid him? Tell us that we may go and get him. When the stranger did not answer Mary, she began to weep. Then spoke Jesus to them, saying, Whom do you seek? Mary said, We seek for Jesus who was laid to rest in Joseph's tomb, but he is gone. Do you know where they have taken him? Then said Jesus, Did not this Jesus tell you, even in Galilee, that he would die, but that he would rise again? These words startled the women, but the master was so changed that they did not yet recognize him, with his back turned to the dim light, and as they pondered his words, he addressed the Magdalene with a familiar voice, saying, Mary. And when she heard that word of well-known sympathy and affectionate greeting, she knew it was the voice of the Master. And she rushed to kneel at his feet 
while she exclaimed, My Lord and my Master. And all of the other women recognized that it was the Master who stood before them in glorified form, and they quickly knelt before him. As Mary sought to embrace his feet, Jesus said, Touch me not, Mary, for I am not as you knew me in the flesh. In this form will I tarry with you for a season before I ascend to the Father. But go, all of you, now, and tell my apostles and Peter that I have risen and that you have talked with me. The fifth Marantia manifestation of Jesus to the recognition of mortal eyes occurred in the presence of some 25 women believers assembled at the home of Joseph of Arimathea at about 15 minutes past 4 o'clock on this same Sunday afternoon. Mary Magdalene had returned to Joseph's house just a few minutes before this appearance. Accordingly, after Mary had pledged all the women to secrecy, she proceeded to relate what had so recently happened. And she was in the very midst of this thrilling recital when a sudden and solemn hush fell over them. They beheld in their very midst the fully visible form of the risen Jesus. He greeted them, saying, Peace be upon you. In the fellowship of the kingdom there shall be neither Jew nor Gentile, rich nor poor, free nor bond, man nor woman. You also are called to publish the good news of the liberty of mankind through the gospel of sonship with God in the kingdom of heaven. Go to all the world proclaiming this gospel and confirming believers in the faith thereof. And while you do this, forget not to minister to the sick and strengthen those who are faint-hearted and fear-ridden. And I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And when he had thus spoken, he vanished from their sight, while the women fell on their faces and worshipped in silence. Of the five Marantia appearances of Jesus occurring up to this time, Mary Magdalene had witnessed four. And so now we learn the truth that Jesus appeared first to a group of women in his new form and then chose a woman to give a message to his apostles. And again did Jesus appear to a group which was composed only of women. And Jesus allows a woman to see his new form repeatedly. I desire to close this podcast with an incredible spiritual experience I heard about. A woman living in Hawaii had just graduated from the University of Manoa and was on her way to return her cap and gown. And I quote, After folding my cap and gown, I placed it on top of my bag and then proceeded on my drive to the University of Hawaii in Manoa. It was the most beautiful morning in paradise. The billowing white clouds were like a moving drama over the ko'olaus, causing constant changes in the sky. Finding parking behind the library, I then began to walk a few steps and crossed a cemented area, which then led to another merging walkway. Turning right, I then walked down a few more stairs and then proceeded left, finally finding myself walking between two high fences about 10 feet apart. The university was doing some construction at the time. As I walked on, I noticed a man walking approximately 12 feet in front of me. He was well over six feet in height, and as I looked at him from behind, he appeared to be a magnificent specimen of manhood. My attention was fully on this unusual man in front of me, 
This is when a strange thought came into my mind. If Jesus were walking on this earth today, he would look very much like this man. It was then that I increased my steps and soon found myself walking side by side with him. Without any hesitation and with surprising boldness, I then said out loud, May I say what I was thinking? Without turning his head, he said, Of course. Then I said, I was thinking that if Jesus were walking on this earth today, that he would look very much like you. And then I added, I hope you are like him inside. That was when the man turned his head and looking straight into my eyes said in a strong, striking, and melodious voice, I am. Those two words reverberated throughout my whole being. In an instant, I felt a rush of warmth come over my entire body. His eyes seemed to look straight inside my soul and a flood of emotions fell upon me with such depth of feeling that I had never experienced before. He said no other words and as we reached the end of the pathway, he took the pathway leading right and I took the pathway leading left. My thoughts continued to race. Maybe it is Jesus. No, it couldn't be. Maybe it is. How could this happen? But I feel like I saw him and spoke to him. There wasn't anything I wanted more than to turn my head and see where he had gone. But for some reason, I could not move. My heart was pounding and all I wanted to do was find him and return to his presence. Then, with great effort, I was able to look back, and when I did, the man was nowhere in sight. Feeling so bewildered, I then stood there wondering where he could have gone. There was not enough time for him to reach the building ahead. Walking slowly, I then continued the debate over in my mind over who that man was and what had just happened. It was then that I recalled the two brothers, Cleopas and Jacob, and how they saw the resurrected Jesus as they walked towards Emmaus. They also felt the burning inside, and it was then that I knew what the brothers meant when they said, No wonder our hearts burned within us as he spoke to us while we walked along the road and while he opened up to our understanding the teachings of the scriptures. Never will I forget the feeling I had as he spoke to me, even though it sounds unlikely or impossible in our day and time to say that I walked and talked with Jesus or one like him. I know what I experienced. This experience opened my realization, understanding, and enlarged many new truths to my most inner soul." End quote. In this experience, we learn firsthand how Jesus has never stopped communicating with women. God appears to women and gives messages, inspiration, and revelation in the days of the past and the present. The real truth is that women are the daughters of God and we are absolutely spiritually equal to men. And it is my desire that this message of truth, light, and emancipation may reach all women all over the world in this present day and in the future days to come. Aloha nui loa to all.